ഫലമുദില്ല <laughs> يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما in these ayahs Allah is telling us that we have to fear him ittaqullah fear Allah so fear Allah in everything everything that you do today i want to talk to you all about the importance of zakat and the necessity of sadaqa in today's world and the importance of understanding and protecting the rights of orphans and those in need the arabic word tazkiya or the purification or something shares the same root word as the word zakat zakat is the compulsory wealth tax on all muslims that have the ability to pay it we're all required to pay uh, an amount on the wealth that we have as long as we meet a certain uh, nisab a certain amount of wealth Uh, in order to pay this but this is compulsory on all of us and something that we should all already be doing however sadaqa is a voluntary form of charity sadaqa holds an extremely high status as well in islam and is something that we should always seek to implement within our lives sadaqa allows us not only purify our wealth but it also gives us the opportunity of tazkiyah tazkiyah nafs which is the purification of the self and purification of the soul imam al qurtubi rahimahullah wrote a story in one of his books related from Imam Al-Ghazali that there will be a man on the day of judgment he'll be sent forth in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will tell him that your scales are equal you have an equal amount of good deeds and bad deeds so this man is going to be in despair he's going to be like oh no like what do i do now so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell him you can go with my mercy and in my infinite wisdom you can go and find someone that will give you one deed that will let you enter jannah So this man he'll go and he'll search and he'll look through the crowds and crowds the billions and billions of people that are there on Yawm al-Qiyamah and he'll find people with thousands and thousands of extra good deeds and not one person will give him a single good deed not a single person will say okay let me just sacrifice one good deed i have enough let me give it to him they'll all say i might need this for myself right and then he'll find this one man this man he said that he went forth before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he only had one good deed his scales were all tipped on the left side on the wrong side and he had a ton of bad deeds and only one single good deed so this man will say you know what this one good deed is going to do me no good so you can have it from me so the man will say thank you and then he'll go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will be like what happened and he said there's this man and he only had one good deed and he gave me that good deed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call forth the other man and say to him I am the most generous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one allowed to have pride and Allah is the most proud and Allah is the most generous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say I am the most generous so for your generosity today you may enter jannatul firdaus. Right? So this is the reward of Allah for helping those in need. Your generosity may be the reason that you enter jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to enter jannatul firdaus. I mean Allah says in the Quran Yas'alunaka madha yunfiquna qul ma anfaqtum min khayrin falin walidayn wal aqrabin falin walidayn wal aqrabin wal yatama wal masakin wa bani as-sabil wa ma taf'alu min khayrin fa inna Allah bihi alim They ask you O oh Muhammad what they should spend in charity say whatever you spend of good is to be for parents and relatives and orphans and the needy and the traveler and whatever you do of good indeed allah is knowing of it in surah al-baqarah ayah 215 this verse tells us that orphans actually have the right to be taken care of it's not something that we're doing and we're helping them out it's a right of theirs on us with every right comes responsibility and the quran places this responsibility on the individual meaning every single muslim should give to orphans in need 
At a public level, rulers have to make sure that orphans are being given their fair share of charity and zakat. And as far as Islam is concerned, this money belongs to them. It doesn't belong to you. As some of you may know, I had the opportunity to go with Qalam Institute to Turkey this past summer. And it was an amazing and spiritually uplifting experience attending halakas at masajid that were hundreds of years old from the time when the Muslim empire was the greatest on, on the face of the earth. And it reminded me of the story of Nur al-Din Zengi. Nur al-Din Zengi was a sultan in the time of the Abbasid Caliphate. And before he was a sultan, he was a general. He was a predecessor of Salah al-Din, who many of you probably know. Nur al-Din had more accomplishments than Salah al-Din, but we haven't heard much about him. One, one day uh, during the Second Crusade, um, there was a crusader who would massacre and devastate and destroy the homes of Muslims everywhere that he went. The Muslims would capture him, but they'd return him to the Christians because they were paid a hefty ransom, a hefty fine for him. So one day, Nur al-Din Zengi and his men, in the spirit of the great general that he was, they were able to capture this crusader. And his men were like, no, this is enough. We're not letting him go ever again, no matter what the ransom is, because this man has done so much harm to the Muslims. We can't let him go. So Nur al-Din says, I think we should wait and we should wait for a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should, we should get some guidance first. Because Nur al-Din was a man of istikhara, which is the dua and the, the prayer that you make whenever you're trying to make a decision. So he told the people, let's wait. The people said, no, we're imprisoning him or we're going to execute him. So that night, Nur al-Din uh, made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking him what he should do. And Nur al-Din was given the revelation. He was guided to let the man go and to take the ransom. So he knew that his people would not be okay with this. So what he did is in the middle of the night, he let the man go and organized a secret meeting with the Christians. And he received the hefty ransom that they paid. In the morning, his soldiers were annoyed, were angry. They were revolting and they were about to overthrow him. And then the news came that the man... The crusader never reached his people. It's because he died on the way of uh, heart conditions, of, of just uh, ailments that they couldn't have foreseen. So this was the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in allowing uh, Nur al-Din to know what to do in that situation. Nur al-Din then talked to his men and his men were like, okay, we should take the money that we receive now and we should put it into cavalry and artillery and get uh, weapons of war. And Nur al-Din said, no, this is not your decision. This is my decision because you didn't listen to me. So what Nur al-Din did is he built something called the Bimaristan. A Bimaristan is one of the first ever instances of a hospital in the world. A Bimaristan was situated in the center of the city and it was open to people regardless of race, ethnicity, class, social status, gender. And no matter who you were, you were treated as if you were royalty. You were given an individual room you were given the food of the sultans and the entertainment of the sultans. Doctors were constantly trained there and given resources to help people further and to, to create new Bimaristan in different cities. The patients there had special rooms and were given the same level of comfort. And there's a, there's a story of a little boy. This little boy, he was an orphan and he came to the doctors of the Bimaristan. These were the best doctors in the world at the time. And he said that his stomach was killing him and he didn't know what it was. So he went through each and every single one of the lower level doctors. And then they said they couldn't find what was wrong with him. So they sent him to the chief of doctors. The chief of doctors looked at him, asked him a few questions. And he told, he told the other doctors, admit him and give him a room for three days. So they gave him a room for three days. They took care of him. They treated him as if he was royalty. And then he was let go. And then the other doctors, they asked, how come he's okay now? What did you do? What was wrong with him in the first place? So the chief of doctors said there was nothing wrong with him. He's an orphan. He was in need. He was hungry and he was tired and he was thirsty and he was in pain. And so we gave him a place to stay and enough energy to recuperate and go about his life after those three days. This is our legacy as Muslims. These are the people that we have to look up to. Warriors that were not just there for the sake of violence, but those that fought for Islam on the, battlefield, on the battlefield and fought for their people off of it. These people created sustainable solutions for combating disease and poverty, but they didn't just provide short-term fixes. They put all of their effort into the betterment of the Muslim Ummah as a whole. 
My visit to Turkey wasn't all witnessing grand structures, however. I had the opportunity to witness and understand the pain of those living in the streets. I saw Uyghur refugees fleeing persecution from China, the orphans and widows that had fled war in Syria, wives that no longer had husbands but had to care for families and children that no longer had parents but had to care for siblings. I saw a woman as I was walking one day in Istanbul sorting through a trash can looking for food for her baby. I saw the man ahead of me give her some money and she continued to search through the trash for food for her child. She was then given some more money, but she continued to search through the trash. As I left her, I wondered to myself why that was. Why wouldn't she move somewhere nicer with what she had gotten and get some food for her baby instead of sitting on the side of the street where whatever she was likely to find would be unsavory and spoiled and inedible to people like us. Then it hit me. She wasn't there because she was looking for food for her next meal. She was there because these people are so uncertain about where their next meal comes from and have such high levels of food insecurity. They're not worried about their next meal. They're worried about their next two meals. They're worried about the meals for the week. This woman likely had a lot of children and a lot of mouths to feed. So whatever I gave her and whatever the other man gave her wasn't enough probably not even for that day. When we give the man on the side of the street a dollar or two, we may give him a coffee or a bagel, but we aren't giving him sustainable long-term solutions. When we send money to those in need, we use that money to implement programs for, that better, for their betterment and long-term help for them. Otherwise, we aren't doing enough. While we must give until it hurts, we must give to projects that will ensure that our money is a source of long-term gain for those that it's helping and a source of long-term reward for us. There was another story of a little girl that I saw on my way to a restaurant in Istanbul. She was doubled over on the floor and I wasn't sure if she was even alive. I went up to her and I nudged her and I asked her, are you okay? Obviously she couldn't understand me because she was Syrian or Turkish. And she looked up at me with the saddest eyes that I'd ever seen. I gave her what little I had, and then I went to the restaurant and the group, I went with a group of people from Qalam afterwards, looking for her to give her our leftovers, but she wasn't there. She had gone home for the night. A few days later, I went looking for her again, and I gave her a little bit more money with the group. And the look on her face is one that I will never forget. The look of ecstasy, the look of joy that she had on her face upon receiving just a few dollars worth of our money. This little girl held the bill up to the sun to make sure that it was real. She couldn't believe that she was getting this much money. And it was just a few dollars to us. The little girl kissed the bill and put it away. And she was so happy that she was doing a little dance on, after we had left her. This is the condition of our brothers and sisters in need. These children don't want anything from you other than a meal for the, for the day. They aren't concerned about an education or a place to stay because they don't have that privilege. They've never been afforded that privilege. We never have to go days without food and weeks without water. We don't open our fridges, which they don't have, by the way, and find nothing for us to eat. We don't have to worry about a middle school education and a pl place to stay. We have millions of dollars in resources available to us from NYU and the IC. So it's time for us to give to those in need. We, what better way to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what he has given us than by using it to serve his servants. Had it not been for them, my heart might be colder and harder than it is right now. And we would have no way of tazkiyah for our nafs and our souls from what we possess. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fajr, addressing the Quraysh, Kalla balla tukrimun al -yateem. This means... No, but you do not honor the orphan. This is in Surah Al-Fajr, Ayah 17. By, re by rebuking the Quraysh for dishonoring orphans, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is simultaneously telling us that orphans must be honored and respected. It is the right of the orphan to be honored and respected. The Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi himself was an orphan. Who are we if we are not taking care of the orphans? How can we call ourselves Muslims if we aren't doing our duty in protecting those in need? As Imam Khalid and Sheikh Aisha have related to us, there was a narration from Anas ibn Malik about his little brother who had a nickname Abu Umayr. He had a pet bird. One day, 
the bird died and Abu Umayyad was extremely sad. The Prophet وسلم, saw this and he asked the people, what's, what's wrong with him? And so the people told him that his pet bird had died. So the Prophet وسلم, said to him, Ya Aba Umayr, ma fa'ala nughayr, making a special little poem for him to cheer him up and honor him in his time of despair when many people would consider, consider, would consider this something below the standard of the Prophet this is something that we have to do. We have to honor the orphans. We have to support them and we have to provide long-term solutions for them. There was another little boy while I was in, while I was in Istanbul. I was on my way to Lalili Jamir, which is uh, one of the ancient masajid in Turkey. And it was across the street from my hotel. And as I, was, as I was walking towards it, a little Syrian boy walked up to me and he could tell that I wasn't Turkish and that I was American. And he came up to me and he started saying things in Arabic like, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and have mercy on you and forgive you as, uh, as he was a Syrian refugee. And he pointed at my pocket and then he pointed at his mouth, indicating that he was asking for food or for money. So then I took out my wallet and I gave him a little bit of money. By the way, in Turkey, the lira is worth around $9 to every $1 that we have. So if we give them a single US dollar, it's as if we give them 10 lira. And for 13 lira, you can have a decent meal. So I thought I was, I was doing him a favor. I thought I was doing him justice by giving him just a couple of lira. Meanwhile, when we go to the corner store or the coffee shop, we spend upwards of $15. We spend as much as we want to spend without thinking about the people that actually need it. We can't sacrifice our own needs and our own wants for the needs not just the, not the desires, just the needs of these children. So he pointed at my pocket and then at his mouth asking for some money. And so I gave him what, a little bit of what I had. On my way to the masjid, he kept following me because he had seen in my wallet some bigger bills. And so he, he followed me and he was tugging at my shirt. And eventually I was at the door of the mas masjid for Salat al -Maghrib, And the boy went down on his knees and he almost tried kissing my feet. I had to help him up and only at that point was the taqwa in my heart strong enough for me to give him more. How is it that it took all of that before I could give him some charity? How is it that I could not sense that he needed it all more than I did? How is it that I didn't give him more? These are questions that I ask myself a lot since that day and it breaks me. Don't let the opportunity of sadaqa pass you by without doing whatever you can. Let us make a conscious effort to love one another for Allah's sake, to forget grudges, to leave off hatred, and to open the doors of our mercy and forgiveness to our Muslim brothers and sisters, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may open the doors of his mercy and his forgiveness and everything good to us. Truly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the opener of doors. Allahumma anta mutatih al abwab اللهم افتح لنا أبواب الخيرات اللهم افتح لنا أبواب رحمتك واللهم افتح لنا أبواب مغفرتك أمين اللهم صل على سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. I want to leave you all with a reminder that next week is Charity Week. Charity Week is dedicated to the support and sustainable uplifting of orphans and children in, and children in need across the globe. With your help and the help of our amazing community, we were able to raise over $70,000 in 2019. This year, bi'ithnillah, we hope to raise even more. Charity Week is all about unity, and the support that we receive from each and every one of you is essential in attaining our goals. Last year, the Director of Islamic Relief, 
heard about the story of a pediatric cardiologist, Dr. Marcello Cardiarelli. Islamic Relief is the organizer and the supporter of Charity Week, and all of our proceeds go to them for helping orphans. So Dr. Marcello, he travels across the world to volunteer his services. He's a pediatric cardiologist, which means he works with babies and uh, helps cure their heart conditions. So he goes to places like Lebanon, where there's a country that can't support its own citizens, much less support the refugees that are outpouring there from Syria across the mountains into, into the Lebanese valleys, into the most despair, despairing parts of the entire world. Imagine a mother with a child. Her husband died in the war. She's fleeing Syria. She's crossing the mountains from, from Syria into Lebanon, into a valley that's not much better than the place that she just came from. She's pregnant and she gives birth to a baby. And this baby, every time he wakes up in the morning, she sees that his fingertips are blue. She sees that he has trouble breathing. She hears his labored heart rate and she doesn't know what to do. And she has no one that can help her. People like Dr. Marcello can help this woman. What this baby has is something that 1% of every child born has. It's called congenital heart disease. It's something that many of you have probably never even heard of because you don't need to. In the United States, that's something that's treatable overnight. As soon as your baby is born, if he has congenital heart disease, they'll figure it out and they'll get him back to you in the morning. In places like Lebanon, where there are Syrian refugees and there are people that can't even support their, themselves, much less their families, this is a fatal heart condition. This is a condition that kills so many children there. It's a, it's a treatable disease and a condition that shouldn't be one that these people have to face. Dr. Marcello Cardiarelli last year pre performed 60 <coughs> surgeries. He trained surgeons to perform even more surgeries. Last year, the Islamic Relief Director heard of his story and asked Dr. Marcello how he could help. So Dr. Marcello asked him uh, to ask Charity Week to fund some of these uh, surgeries. So <coughs> Islamic Relief Director asked Charity Week how much they could fund. So our director at Charity Week told him, asked him how many surgeries he was performing, and he said 60. So he said, you know what? We, by the way, we can't afford a single one of these surgeries by ourselves. These are hundreds of thousands of dollars per surgery. So when we think of what these babies are going through, we can't even afford to help them ourselves. But that's why Charity Week is in the spirit of unity. So when the Charity Week director heard this, he said, you know what? Don't worry about it. We'll raise enough money to cover all 60 surgeries. So last year, we were able to raise enough money to cover every single congenital, congenital heart disease surgery for those children. And every single one of you that participated or gave any money was rewarded not just for the work that you did or for the money that you donated, but for the reward of te training teams of surgeons, for the reward of saving 60 children's lives. That's the impact of Charity Week. And this year, inshallah, we hope to do it again. I'll leave you with one last experience that I had while in Turkey. While in Istanbul, on my way to Suleymaniye Jamir, Jamir means masjid, I was talking to Sheikh Abdurrahman Murphy about knowing our limits for charity and knowing when we've done enough. So I asked him, I know that we're college students and we don't have a lot of money, but how do we know when we've done enough? We see these children that are in much less shape, much worse shape than we are in, and we don't know if we've given enough, but if we give too much, then we might hurt ourselves, right? So he said, everyone knows their own limits. Everyone knows how much it is that you can give until your pockets hurt, but not until you strangle yourself. So then another brother, he heard this story, this, this conversation while we were talking. And then a few days later at dinner, he told me, Shwai, I heard what you were talking about with Sheikh Abdul Rahman, and I have a story for you. This story, by the way, broke me into a million pieces. I broke down in front of one of the role models. I've never cried like that to a story before, but one of my role models, one of the people that I look up to, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, was sitting right next to me and I couldn't control it. And the story was that in Turkey, there's a Grand Bazaar and that's where all the tourists go to buy things before they leave to get for their families and their friends back home. So my friend was walking through the Grand Bazaar and his arms were filled his hands were filled with bags and he couldn't even reach into his pockets. So a little girl came up to him 
and she was tugging at his clothes and she was asking for some money for some food to eat. And he couldn't give her anything because his arms, his hands were full. He was completely covered in bags. And she kept tugging and she kept asking and she walked with him for several minutes until she finally walked away. And he felt horrible. But then he went to the food court with his wife and as they were waiting for their food, he spotted the little girl at another table and she spotted him too. And she was eating from a little plastic bag, a little bit of food that she had managed to muster up from the donations that people had given her in the Grand Bazaar. This was the donation that she needed just for one meal that day. And do you know what she did when she saw him? When she saw him without food, she walked up to him. She walked up to his table with her plastic bag and she asked him, she pushed the bag in front of him and, as if she wanted him to eat some food too. This is the state of these children. We need them more than they need us. If it wasn't for them, we would have no way to purify ourselves. These children care more about you than you care about them sometimes. So prove to yourself that you do care about these children and, and do as much as you can to support them in whatever ways you can. Uh, if everyone can move in this way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us for everything we do this charity week and for everything we do in general and for all of our donations and our sadaqah and our volunteer work. O Allah, ease the suffering of our brothers and sisters across the world and use us as a means for their health and growth. Reward us not just for the donations that we give or the work that we put in, but for every donation given during charity week and for all of the work done across the globe throughout this week. I mean. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا اغفر لنا ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا حب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما أقيم الصلاة